So here's the timeline of what we've been doing. Session one was really with kind of the core stakeholders um, to just kind of get our heads wrapped around a way we could facilitate this in a way to get a lot of voices involved and um, really have a good process. Then in the second session was really about the CDOT revitalizing Main Streets program in downtowns and thinking about how we can create grant criteria to recognize downtown strategies that communities have and think about how do these grants that CDOT provides fit into the bigger picture of, of really good downtown visioning and strategies. And so we're now we're on the third session where we're looking at the fiscal impacts of development patterns and really thinking about how, how land use, uh, the revenues from different land use uh, patterns as well as the costs of the infrastructure to serve those land use patterns are really linked in an important way. And then on number four, we're going to be looking at a potential grant program um, that CDOT, DOLA, and the Energy Office, Colorado Energy Office, are working together on to create criteria for more sustainable developments in a, in a bigger picture. And then once we get into December, we'll be doing uh, some more refining of the grant criteria and thinking about next steps. So we invite you to think about how to, uh, you may want to participate in future sessions on these things. Next slide. Nathan, before, um, before we introduce Joe, um, I'd like to, I uh, apologize. Can you please introduce yourself via chat? So put your name and your organization in the chat so we know that you're here. Again, welcome to the to the meeting. Um, if you just put your name and your organization in the chat, that'll help us in terms of the um, <clears throat> that um, just to welcome you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Yeah, great idea, Jonathan. And if we could put also in the chat maybe some information about uh, the registration for session four and five, if we have that. Um, and then I think we've got a slide on that at the end. But um, so yeah, so with that intro. Um, I want to welcome Joe Minicosi to this session. Um, Joe is the principal at Urban 3 and a uh, resident in Asheville, North Carolina, and a real leader in the space of thinking about how uh, revenues and, and the cost of infrastructure are linked. And he's, he's been uh, done so many projects, both in Colorado and around the country, to really bring this to the forefront of municipal leaders' minds, uh, state leaders' minds, and thinking about, you know, how we can have successful communities um, that are that are fiscally successful, economic development successful, and successful in quality of life. So, Joe, thank you for being here, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, also, um, I have a very long history with Nathan. We met I hate to say it, I think like 10 years ago um, when Nathan was in Rifle, Colorado, and we did a project with the Sonoran Institute. It's been a while. Um, and let me go ahead and get my screen up here. Yeah, while you're doing that, I can add, I remember sitting at you with at Clark Anderson's table and looking at your spreadsheets while everyone else was drinking beer. So I, you, <laughs> even then I could tell you were, you were going to go somewhere. <laughs> uh, you're a nerd. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was right there with you. <laughs> well, and also Nathan's spent time in Asheville, so I'm going to maybe raz Nathan a little bit because now he's in both sides as a planner and in the transportation world. Um, but basically, my, my talk is going to mostly focus on the connections of transportation and land use, but also how cities cash flow. So as I said earlier, I'm, I live in Asheville. We have a different kind of mountains over here, not as not as big as yours. Um, but the two tallest mountains east of the Mississippi are around Asheville. We're home of uh, bluegrass music, uh, southern uh, mountain music, and uh, we're 90,000 people. We have 40 breweries. And um, like any quirky little mountain town, we have men dressed as nuns on telebikes that eat fire. Asheville didn't really start this way. This is what we grew into. Uh, we've always been a tourism town. But there was a time when Asheville just basically neglected its downtown. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually stems from my work with this company, Public Interest Projects, which is a for-profit real estate development company. Um, the cool thing about working at Public Interest Projects is we invested in 
storefronts, buildings, businesses in the buildings, but also fixing buildings. And we did a lot of advocacy downtown um, for the uh, economic environment of our community. Um, we also did a lot of social justice and community activism as well. And that was the spirit of Julian that would allow us to do that. But it was really simple, you know, at a, at a crude level is downtown revitalization. So this is one of our buildings on Main Street and this is what it came into. So it, it was sitting right there. We just had to peel the skin off of it and turn the old hotel into apartments. But from an advocacy position, we always had to explain like, what does it mean to everybody else? How do we show the data of what a downtown revitalization project is doing to the whole community? What does it mean and how are we all connected? Cities are essentially very large real estate development projects. And actually, if you look at the word incorporate in the Oxford American Dictionary, it says to constitute a company, a city or other organization is a legal corporation. So you have a city charter, it's a, a corporate charter for that corporation with a board of directors. So is your county, so is the state of Colorado, so is our country. So the American system of government, and the reason why corporations are seen as people is because our government is seen as a corporation. So it's intertwined in how we are. Actually, Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert show in 2016 when he was still vice president. And I'm such a nerd, I looked it up. So if for any, any legal, legal nerds out there, at the bottom of the slide is the US federal code that lists us as a federal corporation. So this is how we operate. So Asheville at $14 billion is seven times the value of Ted Turner. So would a real estate development company worth $14 billion, would they make economic decisions based off who's complaining on Facebook? Of course not. You wouldn't expect Ted Turner to do that. So why is my community doing that? So if we don't hold our elected officials to a more data-driven discussion, it's going to fall down to the politics of what people believe and not necessarily have the data on. So, so back to that city, the city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. So once you put infrastructure out there, you, you better make sure that you're recouping the cost of that infrastructure in the architecture that's built alongside it. So I'll give you a really simple way of looking at this. Um, if you talk to farmers, farmers are always talking about land in economic terms, water per acre, labor per acre, et cetera. So this is one of our buildings that we rehabbed. The city did the streetscape project. So thank you city for the subsidy of a garbage can, a bike rack, two benches and a street tree. So that's an urban modality of transportation put at our front door. Um, incidentally, there were people that accused us of being subsidized. So it's like, okay, awesome, whatever, $20,000, $40,000 worth of stuff at our front door, whatever. Um, we took the building's taxable value from 300,000 to 11 million. So that represents a 3,500% increase in taxes that this building paid, even though it was sitting in the portfolio already. Like, so you didn't have to build a new building, it was already there. So my community gets 3,500% more taxes. Do you have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? No. So just think of that, that's potent. But again, there's biases that people have. And they're like, well, Joe, that's $11 million. This Walmart's 20 million. Fair enough, it took 34 acres of my corporation versus our building at 0.2. So when you look at the gross number, that's like arguing miles per tank rather than miles per gallon, right? The building's bigger. It's got a lot more square footage. It's got a lot more real estate. It doesn't make it more potent. So per acre, we're producing 100 times more property taxes. Now in Colorado, this, the counties in Colorado should care about this the same way my county should here. But in Colorado, your counties get the, the majority of the property taxes. For the cities, you get the property, you get the retail taxes. So who would have thought that a furniture store or a tattoo shop and a beauty salon are double the retail productivity of a Walmart? They are, there's the data. Jobs and also, or sorry, residents and also jobs. So, you know, I've, I've been presenting this in Colorado a lot. Um, I presented it in Seattle in 2009. This is kind of the basis of our work. And in Colorado, let's think of it this way. If you could grow something, what would you grow? Wheat or marijuana? You're going to grow the cash crop. I mean, it's that simple. So if we understand that with crops, just take that same language into understanding the city. So just don't overthink this. This isn't complex math that I'm doing here. It's really simple fifth grade division um, to understand the analysis. Now, the land use relationship with transportation um, I'm just going to do a little side project here because there's a highway project in my community that really kind of bothers me that um, the NEPA laws are here to protect us from how this infrastructure is being put in our community. But um, this is my downtown. You can see Main Street right here, Patton Avenue. And then once you leave the central business district, for some reason, it turns into a federal highway for about a mile and then it turns back into a state road. 
So the same road all the way through our city, and you can see the cross section and how wild it is. So everybody knows that it's kind of stupid to run a federal highway on a local road. We all get that. And then as a community, we're like, can we just peel that off and just go this way? And everything was fine until our state DOT started coming forward with the plans. So I was part of a group. We started a nonprofit in 2006. Uh, Bill, the guy on the right, we kicked him out of his office and took over. We just basically just started... We didn't have the, we weren't seen on the team of the DOT, people that were trained in urban design, city planning, landscape architecture, urban, uh, urban economics, or real estate development on the team. So we just went ahead and just donated our time to do it, just to give to the project. So this is the design that we were getting um, from, from our DOT. And this, you can see how they just kind of, the lime green stuff is all new. The, the reds are all new bridges. I mean, they're adding a lot of infrastructure to our community. So I started talking to, I'd go to rotary clubs, whatever, and show, show the community, like this is all the new infrastructure. We can take all this spaghetti here and squeeze it down to this. If we just did a double-decker bridge, we could reduce the economic impact to our community as well as the design impact. Um, little non sequitur for a second. Our state DOT, I remember, I remember being in the meeting and they told me to my face, like, well, we don't have a double-decker bridge in North Carolina, so we can't do that. And I said, well, Kentucky's got four. The, the first double-decker bridge was designed and built in the 1400s. Like, surely we could do something like that. But it's just this kind of lunacy that they would say something like that to a citizen when we could actually reduce impacts. Now, we're doing a lot of other things. We're um, going to do a lot of urban design around the edges. It's not just the road. We're not saying don't do the highway. We're saying don't minimize or don't max, maximize the impact, minimize it. And do a cool bridge. This is a, 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 a the Blinko Viaduct that we have right here in the in the Blue Ridge Parkway, or the Natchez Trace Bridge, the Arches Bridge, and the Natchez Trace in Tennessee, or in South Carolina. Like do something that adds value to the community. This is in in Portland, Oregon. This is a double decker bridge, and they actually build bike racks that look like the bridge. They sell real estate with the view of the bridge. Do something that adds value rather than detracts to the community. So how how about a cool bridge? But the other thing that we're doing, if you go back for a second, this move of pulling the highway off the local road, we can use that as real estate development and take that non-taxable land. And um, once, the, once the highway connection is made and you pull the, the local highway off, you've got this local connection, you've got all of this real estate you can add. In fact, we actually drew we had a bunch of architects who we went ahead and drew it. Now we're not, again, not saying don't do the highway, we're saying we, this is an opportunity to add value in our community and add real estate, right? So the architects drew it, the landscape architects did their thing. We had transportation planners that took the existing, um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that. That took the existing roadway and did this. So as the architects were doing this and they're showing me the numbers or that showed me the square footage, I ran the economics on it. So this is currently producing a big old goose egg of no taxes to us. And this is a 2007, I did these numbers. So that's about $700 million of new development opportunity. Uh, I think 1,500 units of housing, uh, a bunch of retail. That represents a taxable loss if we don't do this. Because remember, once it's built and producing taxes, we don't get a, we don't, if we don't do this, we don't get another bite at this apple for another 50 years. So when you net out all of those taxes, this is the economic impact of not having that building, those buildings, $111 million. So tell us in the EIS about that. Now, as we were working with DOT, they took, they took our initial design and put their flavor on it. And they started like widening out and everything. So here's our original footprint that we suggested. And they had the chutzpah to call their alternative 4B um, the same thing. And you can see how much more real estate they took. They just thinking about the speed of cars and not the imp impact at a financial standpoint. So this is a trade-off. If you want to make your cars go faster, they're going to need wider radii and all this stuff. What's the cost and consequences of that? So, um, and on honestly, from my perspective, it looks like they're going right back to their original drawing board. So it's like, just give us our, our option. You can do whatever you want, but don't mess it up. Um, so this is just how it looks on the ground. And we'll come back to this, but this is supposed to be a local boulevard. And look what they're doing with the intersections. Um, this is, you know, we drew it, but you, you can see there's no crosswalks in this. Look at these curvatures and God knows what the hell's going on here. And they have these speed intersections and they're basically gobbling up all the real estate that we're trying to save and preserve for economic growth. 
This is where if you don't listen to your citizens, if you don't think about the economic effects and you only think about moving cars as fast as possible, you can really shoot yourself in the foot in an economic standpoint. And then secondly, what about the bridge? So this is the bridge that they currently have on the table. Um, so I don't know, I'll just ask you all. I'm, I'm trained in architecture and design. Do these look like the same things? And this bridge on the right is like 20 lanes across. We're like, come on now, does it need, does it need to be this way? And Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and out myself here. As a community activist, that really bothered me, that they would continue down this path after four years of working with us. And so in 2016, we called them out on it. If we could go look at the weather forecaster and see, does the forecaster get the, get the forecast right? We pulled their economic projections from the original time the highway was done to their first projection, which was in 1980 when they started the project. They said in the year 1995, there's going to be 54,000 trips. All right, well, we can go back and look. By the way, this is what the straight line projection looks like. This is the actual. So we've got the data. We can see how they how they get did from a projection. So that's pretty close. But, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> in 95, they did another projection and our trips kept going. And then for some reason in 2003, they projected way the hell up here. How could you look at this data and see that they're being competent with their projections? How can I believe your math if this is what's going on with our actuals in green? And you can see their Hail Mary passes. Now, our city transportation engineer called them out on that projection and asked them to readjust. It took them two years to do their math and they readjusted it down to here. Okay, that's cool. Our trips keep going. And then for some reason, don't know why, they did a readjustment back up again in 2010 um, to 122,000 in about 2030. So here's the actual. So just for fun, I took a... Um, straight line projection of just looking back 12 years and just projecting forward. We did this with an intern, you know, it wasn't complicated, just a straight line projection going forward. And I was blown away that when we pulled the data in 2015 and 2017, me and my intern are closer at projecting the future trips than all the DOT math that's out there. So as a, as a professional, how can I hold you credible for this, for these projections and this math? So, you know, I just, these are professionals doing this and I'm sure they believe in their math the same way that Gary Spivey believes that he could see the future as a psychic. So is, is Gary like working for DOT doing these projections into the future? Maybe he is, I don't know. But how can I hold you credible as a professional if this is what you're doing and there's massive economic impacts in my community? And it's really hard for me to do that. I'm, I'm being pointed because Jane Jacobs called this out and she's been calling it out for 30 years before she passed away. The traffic engineering is a bogus profession. It's a pseudoscience masquerading this knowledge. I would agree. When you look at the EIS and their economic impacts, the law says you're supposed to show all cost benefit and it's supposed to be prepared in a relationship between the analysis and the analysis of unquantified environmental impacts, values and amenities. When you look at the entire economic section in the EIS for this billion dollar project, um, this is it right there. So basically, they say it's going to be maybe 1% of your city is going to be impacted. So we're a $14 billion city. Um, so 1% is like $140 million. That's what they're saying the value is. Um, well, that equals 80, a loss of $84 million over 50 years. So why don't you just tell my community that our design standards are causing a loss of $84 million? The other thing is, you could go out and see this building that just got built right here, and you could rubber stamp it into the into the right of way and see that that's actually 175 million, just that by itself. So that's more than 140 million. Or go back to our original numbers and see that 700 million is more than 140 million. How can I hold you credible if you're just not even taking the the professional advice that we're giving you? So as a citizen. When you tell me that it's only a $140 million impact, when I know it's at least 175 up to a billion dollars of value, that's a lot more than 140 million. So this translates into a loss of $516 million worth of local taxes. So by my state's wanton use of all my real estate in my community so that they can make things move faster, it doesn't necessarily move more volume. And it also causes more economic hardship in my community. So the effects on tax base are a critical component of how things work. So this is, you know, I actually sent in a protest letter about this paragraph because they really need to be telling my community 
that it's between an $84 million and $500 million loss in taxes. Just be straight with us. Don't dance around the edges and, and want me to respect your professional opinion on that. Um, so, I mean, we all know the drill. This is, this is what's going on with our trips. Um, they're, they're seeing a peak of getting a level of service of, of F and capacity. And so they designed the whole project around that one little bump. Meanwhile, we have this economic waste of our landscape all around it that, that has an economic effect. It's not just about the street, the highway, or that transportation modality. It's about all the land use that gets that going, right? You're, you're, you're getting out of your car at some point. So to save two minutes of time in my community is a $516 million impact. If we got to decide, do we want to spend $516 million or lose $516 million to save two minutes or can we all blow the two minutes? Why not? We'd also choose different modalities of, of, of transportation. So looking at, and again, these are 2007 numbers. If, if you've got 1500 units that could go into this urban typology in this project area, we could also run the miles driven, the gasoline consumed, the kilowatts, all of that. This is really easy to do. This is the uh, carbon effect of, of sprawl. So if these people don't get built in this area, they're gonna go somewhere further out in the community, which would make some suburban development. So this is basically the, the economic and, and environmental effect of not using land in your community. That if you create these highway interchanges in the middle of your city, you're essentially transporting all of those carbon effects out into the region because people are gonna have to drive and this is stuff that should be calculated. This is not insignificant to add 2000 tons more of CO2 because of the choice to drive two minutes faster. It's also not insignificant for the numbers of how much you're spending or losing economically. So as we look at our community wealth, we have to realize that we're actually spending it one way or another, whether we choose to or not. And oftentimes those choices aren't in front of us where we can understand them. Does that make sense? So if, if, if I don't show you that you're losing money, you could still actually be losing money if you don't do the math. And I would say that as a, as a, as a taxpayer and as an American citizen, we have federal laws that say that the team needs to be interdisciplinary and check out that third sentence there, or that third line. Somewhat, the, the team has to be trained in the environmental design arts and planning and in decision making. This isn't just about being an engineer on the team. So when I look at our team of people that are bringing us this highway, here's their, their makeup. The majority of them are engineers. And just to be, you know, just to be um, fair, I looked at the training of every single professional that's been involved on this project and just cut them some slack if they had like a, a Bachelor of Arts. It's not design arts, but hey, whatever. So there is no one trained in design arts in here. So the federal law says that those people should be in there, but they're not. So as a citizen, this is an accretion of all of these things that just, just hammer us so we have an economic impact. So that's a personal fight that I've been through. That's a citizen complaint against my government. But I want to challenge you in your profession, in your actions, are we guilty of this? Am I guilty of this in the way that I bring information to the table? And I would argue that we need to bring things forward so that people can see it. And, and challenge me about my data as well. But we show people, like if I can show you your brain activity uh, with your brainstem activity in blue and your creative thought process in green, can we do this for your community? So this is my county, um, total taxable value. So we have non-taxable in gray over here. This is Mount Mitchell Park, this is Mount Pisgah down here. Low value is in green, high value is in purple. So this is the Biltmore Estate, that's worth $100 million right there for one parcel. But it's a 180,000 square foot house sitting on 8,000 acres. So it's like having the biggest miles per tank. It doesn't tell you about efficiency. So rather than total value, here's value per acre and I'll just show it to you in 3D. So you can see the productivity of my city, my core of my city, hiding in plain sight in the model. I don't even have to label downtown, I can show it to you. So in defense of all the people that moved out in the Fairview, who think that they're paying a tremendous amount of taxes, they don't know what we're paying in downtown, so show them. You know, this is, we're all county taxpayers here. Now, from a physical standpoint, you can also see our little cousin of Biltmore, or of Black Mountain, you can see it's downtown popping up here too. So the way that our tax system works in retail and in property tax is that that, that urban environment, that walkable core 
is actually highly, highly productive in, 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 uh, in tax flow. And it has a very small amount of infrastructure compared to you stretching out into the suburbs, particularly on the south side. You can see all that infrastructure that stretches out with very little return. So I would advocate that you have to show people this stuff. Don't just talk about it. And when you, particularly with economics, show people. And again, people have biases. I've heard it plenty of times. People are like, well, our state's different. It's like, all right, well, here's Manchester, New Hampshire. Guess where downtown is. Here's Bozeman, Montana. Guess where downtown is. Here's Kansas City. Guess where downtown is. Now, what's cool about this model, by the way, don't think of your city as having just one downtown. So for, for all y'all that live in Denver, you know this, there's like all different kind of areas. They're not, they're not like downtown, but they have their own little urban core. So you can see Country Club Plaza down here, which doesn't, you know, there aren't skyscrapers down there. There's some big buildings, but you can see the potency of that density in that neighborhood core that's outside of downtown. So the city can actually be a polynucleated economic model if you allow it to grow that way. And it don't have to be a big city. Here's a small city. This is this is Brevard, North Carolina, which is like 8,000 people. You can see it's downtown too. And again, Colorado, you're not that different. So this is Fort Collins and Greeley and Windsor. We just did a project in Windsor. Um, and just to show you, this is your this is your actual value. This is how you actually function. You all have a state tax break baked right into your model. Here and here's where it is. So you tax your, your commercial at about 30% of value. You tax your residential at about 7% of value. So that is a tax break. So residential, you're paying four times less potency than commercial. Be honest with your citizens, but, but check out the difference. So here's again, actual value and just pay attention to the suburban stuff in Greeley, Windsor and Fort Collins and look at how it drops off the planet. The core, the commercial stuff is still productive. Let's do that again. Here's actual value. And here's what you're actually paying taxes on. So we all want to live in, in single family detached house. We all want to have a big yard. I want to have like a mountain bike trail in the backyard. This would be all really cool to do, but there's economic consequences when you start to stretch out and somebody has to build that road out to you. Uh, we did a model in Durango. Here's, here's the property tax model. So the county should be all over helping downtown out, building a streetscape project, doing a bike rack, whatever, because the county is getting the lion's share of taxes out of that downtown stuff. When you look at the retail taxes, South Durango is where the mall, the Home Depot, the Walmarts, all that down here in South Durango. This is the retail tax production. Downtown's still winning. Uh, total tax production, jobs. Uh, we had a couple of businesses there that opened their books to us. They wanted an apples to apples comparison. Um, these are the two guys on Main Street Tim Wheeler and Peter Schertz, um, who have one-story retail. So we compared their one-story retail against Walmart. So here's the property taxes. Who would have thought that these two mom and pop shops are producing, what is that? Uh, 15 times the property tax production, seven times the retail tax. Again, this is, this is the data and a lot more jobs. So at an economic level, which side is paying their employees more per hour? They're both retail sector jobs. Do you think the blue side or the gray side is paying more per hour? It's probably going to be the blue side. It's going to be a nickel or a dime more, but small businesses do that. Now let's ask the next economic question. Who's hiring the local accountant, the local attorney, the local website designer? Is it the blue side or the gray side? It's going to be the blue side. So if we don't incentivize or think through the incentives that we build into the system, that Walmart pays more, consumes more in police services than it pays in property taxes. That Walmart frontage, in the, so if you've consumed all of your property taxes, will you ever be able to pay for that street light that was put in for your Walmart? No, the money's just not there. And just not to rub it in, we looked at the districts over time, over a 10 year window, and this is downtown right here and what its economic retail sales production was compared to South Durango. So as a strata, it was 86% of South Durango. So it wasn't as much, but it's close. Now, if you look over time through the recession and as we come out of the recession, you can see downtown actually grew in its production and it actually started to catch up to 91% of South Durango. So we just looked at the next numbers, which is like, all right, well, is downtown adding more buildings? How are they catching up? So we pulled the square footage of new buildings pulled, built in south in downtown 
versus what was added in South Durango. So as they were adding, I mean, I don't know how many more times more real estate and, and, and square footage they were adding, downtown was actually catching up by doing less. Let that wash over you for a second. So as you drain your city and build those big roads out to the middle of nowhere, it's gonna cause new development, but is it causing productive development? So this is all a spatial relationship. I know this joke doesn't work for people under the age of 35, but for the older people, you get this one. It's spatial, make it spatial. And also look into your biases of how you look at your cash flow. Um, so particularly with streets, Lancaster, California, up and over the mountain from Los Angeles, um, 166,000 people. It's an exurb in Los Angeles County. Here's their, their cash flow model. They don't have a great downtown. They have like one building that's like six stories tall. You can spot it in the model. And then their downtown is kind of dead. They're trying to build that back up. The problem is, is how they grew. They actually added, they have right now 953 miles of roads. I don't know what that looks like. So we put it on a map to show them. They have a road that you can build from Los Angeles to Portland. So every 50 years, they have to rebuild that road to Portland, which is insane. The other thing is understand how your municipal environment operates, that our public officers who handle the finances put roads into an asset schedule, which is insane to me. So when we talk to finance officers, I usually tell them, I'm like, look, my computer's an asset. If I had a delivery vehicle, it's an asset. If I had a piece of real estate, it's an asset. I can sell the computer, the van, and the real estate. Can you sell your roads? Can Greeley sell their roads to Fort Collins? No, that's a liability. So when you look at a liability, it's completely different. This is what happens when you build a road. There is an ongoing maintenance cost of about, you know, we, we say about $100 a lane mile for plowing, patching, alligatoring, whatever. Every 10 years, you have to do a millage. You should at least do a little skim or rehab scraping the surface off. That's expensive, that's 310,000 a mile. And you should be doing that every 10 years. Talk to your engineers about this, they'll tell you. Uh, you could probably stretch that out, but you can't avoid doing that. That's like brushing your teeth. And then every fifth cycle, you have to do a total rehab. You have to get down under the surface and get to the, the substrate of, of, the, of, the, of the road. So there is an ongoing liability to owning this asset that does not disappear. In fact, once you make it to the cycle, it starts all over again. That's the reality of a road. So it's about a million dollars a mile that you need to reserve to base, basically afford a road. So back to, back to real estate development. So if I own this other asset, this mall, let's say, Another way of thinking of it is that when we buy a building, we know that we have to replace the air conditioners every 20 years or so, and those are going to cost us $85,000 a pop. I need to build a savings account to accrue that money by year 20. I also need to figure out that it's going to cost me $35,000 for a sky crane and a crew to put them in. So every 15 to 20 years, I need $205,000. It's got to come from somewhere. And we should be thinking about our roads internally to our city, as well as our state roads and our county roads as well. Um, so looking at their road system of what they own, this is when they built all of their roads as a timeline. And you can see what they did in 1953. They built a lot of lanes in one year. Well, guess what? That comes back to haunt their parents' generation in 1983. They have to rebuild all of that stuff. And when they were hit with that huge capital expense, they annexed more land and let out more development, which means they got more roads. You can see it right there. So this comes back with the second rebuild and brings along with it the new stuff. So we just stopped them in 2016 and just said, look, what are you carrying and how does this look in the future? And this is their build rebuild schedule of what they are currently own, not even adding another road to this, to this model. And we're also not including inflation. And we're not including the fact that asphalt is going up to seven, seven to 10% per year in cost, because guess what? Asphalt's a fossil fuel. So this stuff is going, this is just not inflation adjusted. And you can look back at that first wave and see how stupid that is. And Greeley did it as much as Lancaster did it. And then they went ahead and doubled down on it. And now it's getting bigger and bigger. So as we talk about climate change and worrying about the future, we really have the big heart attack we're sitting on with our current infrastructure. We're not gonna be able to afford this stuff. So show people. So we flush their money into their road system. They can only afford about 50% of their roads. That's the reality of their cash flow. <coughs> this is a problem that we're all dealing with right now. It's, it's the problem of kicking the can down the road. And I understand that this is depressing 
and there are ways out of it. So in Eugene, Oregon, this is their revenue model. This is floating their whole city in a lake, metaphorically speaking. And this is their cash flow of their entire city if you're looking at the side of the city hovering in the water. Below the water line is their sunk cost. So if you net your cost against your revenue, this is what's net positive and net negative. So here's the top of the model where you can see what's in the black, what's net positive. If you lift this model up like you're looking for a salamander under a rock, this is what's net negative. And it really comes down to a really simple analysis of building types. So we, we worked with their planning staff to break that down to just the ingredients of the city. And I call this the Brady Bunch slide, but it's basically residential, low density, medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium, high, commercial, low, medium, and high. And these are the sticker prices. This is not a surprise. Um, you know, the Nixon administration published in 1973 a document called the Cost of Sprawl. All this data was in that. This is all the data in their own community. So we, this is all the stuff that the, we just got out of the planning department. This is easy to get. So there's also a bias here. Now, when you're showing the audience like, hey, yeah, the majority of the community is subsidized, that doesn't fly too well because people want houses. But you have to show them that you can do that. You can't do 80% of your diet and subsidy. 80% of the land use is single family housing. It's just not going to work out. So back to the transect for the planners on the call. You know, we have these, if you view the city like a tree ring, you shouldn't just do one tree ring is 80% of the tree. It's just not going to work out. So look at back to the model and, okay, you need to do more stuff downtown. That's your golden goose right here. Do more infill. But the model is actually showing you up here at Crescent Village on the north side up there. In your comp plan, just do find four more areas to grow that new little baby downtown or neighborhood core and grow those areas up so you can afford that suburban development. Secondly, look at your fees, look at your infrastructure, see if you're subsidizing things inadvertently. This is their sewer system map. Each of these districts is their own sewer trunk line, if you will. So it's its own little encapsulated infrastructure package. And when I was talking with the engineer, I said, so when you flush a toilet, does everybody pay the same per gallon flush? And he's like, well, yeah, but of course. I'm like, really? Okay, so everybody's paying the same per gallon flush. So these people up here pay the same per gallon as these people down here. He's like, of course, that would be fair. I was like, okay, is it fair that these people have eight lift stations and these people don't? So the lift station is expensive. That's where you have to lift sewerage uphill. Um, I asked him, I'm like, how much is a lift station? He's like a uh, million dollars. I'm like, okay. And what does it cost to maintain those lift stations every year? And he said 50,000. And I said, so this, this neighborhood has uh, $20 million worth of infrastructure that this neighborhood doesn't. And he was just stunned. Okay, for environmentalists in the call, why would you need a lift station? Because you have to lift it uphill, which means that that's a wetland that they built in. That's low lying land that they have to lift the sewerage back out of. They should have never built in that neighborhood. So not only is it bad environmentally, we're actually subsidizing that neighborhood to be there. And these subsidies are all over the place. Um, I'll show you a land use example. This is in South Bend, Indiana. These are 88 houses in the traditional core. This is this insane cul-de-sac of cul-de-sacs um, of 88 houses. So you can just go talk to your engineer. We talked to their engineers to get the full, you know, square footage of asphalt, uh, the 88 houses. We figured out their road obligation is about $75,000 a year. We also did that for the water pipes, the sewers and storm water to figure out the nut of what they should be paying per year is a savings account for this development. So this costs the community about $122,000 a year for those 88 houses. Now, if you look at their actual tax contribution, into the public works department, it's only 21,000. So there's your subsidy. This neighborhood is subsidized at $100,000 a year. You follow me? So let's do the same back to this neighborhood in their 88 houses and do the same thing. I'm just gonna fly through this. Uh, so you've got their money that they put in, which is about the same, and they have less cost. So when you put them side by side, you can see that this one's 78,000, 79,000, let's say. This one's 122,000 of cost. The revenue is about the same. Actually, the revenue is a little bit less in the new development. The cost is more. So that means the subsidy is almost two times the subsidy on the right versus the left. So 
let the community see that. Is this the best use of our dollars? In the case of South Bend, they're not adding more people. So they don't have the money to spread around. So they're motivated to do this because they're going broke. The scary thing is growing communities don't look at themselves. They're just growing as, and they don't understand how they're growing. Um, just for fun in Eugene, we said to them, we said, well, what does the city pay for stormwater impact? And the engineer was like, why, we don't. What are you talking about? And we said, well, if you take all of your roads and squeeze them together, the roads would equal a parking lot that's like three square miles in area. Three, th three th that's, that's the size of it right there at the same scale as the city. So that's a pretty big watershed right there. Somebody should pay for that. And they don't. You don't charge your cities for stormwater impact. You pass that off onto the property tax, per the property owner. Now, the person that chooses to live way the hell out here at the north side of town requires all of that road infrastructure. They should be paying more out there because remember, this is all geospatial. They have enough roads to go from, Los from uh, Eugene to San Francisco. This is a huge surface area. So let follow me here on this, on this abstract thought process for a second. If this is the whole city, let's squeeze the city into a square. This is the total area of the, of the, of the city. This is the, the footprint of impervious buildings, parking, and roads. That's all impervious. Got it. So the numbers are there. Just put them out there. It's five square miles of buildings, three square miles of parking and roads. So roads and parking are about the same. And this is everything else, berms, buffers, backyards, whatever. When you pull the total values of this stuff, the buildings are pulling the lion's share of the wealth at 2 billion of value. Parking's insignificant at 245 million. Roads are costing you 600 million. Uh, quick sidebar here, planners, we have a term called logical rational nexus for planning, right? Policy should have a connection logically back to its origination. So if we know that cars cost us $600 million to move around, when cars stop, why aren't they costing $600 million of value? Those two numbers should match. And when they don't, that's a subsidy because that means you raid the building fund to pay for the loss of roads because the stuff that we like, the berms, buffers, backyards, it doesn't, cost, doesn't have any value to it. So when we were talking to the engineer, I said, just follow me on a, on a thought process here for a second. Your whole entire stormwater system costs about $400 million, let's say. So if, if let's say we had a, a mandate or a culture that wanted to have more two-story buildings than one-story buildings. We stacked up that impervious surface on top of each other rather than putting it side by side. We could probably get the buildings closer together. If we did that, we'd need less parking, which means we'd need less roads. So if we cut the surface area of the buildings in half and the parking in half, doesn't all of that cut the impervious surface in half, which means we cut the stormwater system in half? And he said, yes. I said, so we've gone from a $400 million system to a $200 million system. And he said, yes. And I said, so if we go back in time, did anybody ever give the citizens the choice to say, what's the best way to spend an extra $222 million? If we could do that to the citizens and say, how do you want to spend $222 million? You want to stretch out into the, into the mountains, into the landscape and, and, and drive around on all of these extra roads and have all of this parking? Or do you want to have uh, an art teacher, a, a more greenways or a dancing traffic cop or send all of your kids to um, Stanford for grad school. Like what's, what are the best choices for $222 million? Let's give our community those options. And for those of you that are thinking, Joe, you're crazy. Uh, this is way sophisticated. I deal with little towns like Nathan was out in Rifle. Okay, let's go back to Brevard for a second and back to their model. When we showed this to Mayor Jimmy. I mean, seriously, this guy's name is Mayor Jimmy. He's been mayor for 30 years. Everybody calls him Mayor Jimmy. He, he works in the hardware store right next door to City Hall. And when he saw this model, he goes, well, we're doing stormwater. Could we do, do a similar model? And we said, sure. So here's your, here's your taxable model. Here's your stormwater runoff. And yes, downtown is impervious and has a lot of runoff. But we took this as a jello mold and dropped it on the taxes to show that you're getting more taxable gain out of the downtown than the suburban strip. So these are mountain people. So we did a mountain profile of this whole thing. This is the taxes, here's the runoff. So here's the problem. And you can see in downtown, the, 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 the ring around the main street is all surface parking, which is not producing a lot of economic effect. So find some way to do maybe a parking deck and get more buildings there so you get more taxes. You don't lose parking, you just are more efficient with the runoff. Um, that's one way of handling it. Give them a tax holiday or a TIF or something to do it. But out here in the, in the, in the exurbs, when you look at the sprawl 
and the Walmart, it's never going to pay enough taxes to catch up to it. Totally different animal. You can't densify a Walmart until you take it down. So we need to understand that not all impervious surfaces are created equal. These have totally different economic effects um, in, in the community. There are other subsidies. This is a subsidy I've shown a million times. Um, this is taking the, the, the buildings off the land and looking at just the dirt value per acre. So you can see up here, all of this neighborhood is blue. That's $15,000 an acre. Um, when I was, that seems reasonable. When I was presenting this to the community, I said, why is this blue here for the dirt, $15,000 an acre? And when you cross the street in the same zoning category, it doubles. And the tax assessor was there and she raised her hand and she goes, hang on a second, you don't understand. This one's got more land. So the more land you have, the lower the value. And I said, okay, so this guy's got 200 feet of infrastructure. This blue parcel has three miles of infrastructure around it. You're gonna tax it less with more infrastructure. And she said, we don't count infrastructure as part of the value. If we're not asking these questions as planners, as, as citizens, that's a subsidy. Somebody should be asking that. So. I actually went to the assessor's conference. I said to her, I said, if you're giving me more stuff, I'm going to do more of it. There's no disincentive to do suburban sprawl. If you build a road out to the edge of your community and I don't pay for that whole entire road, that's awesome. And then if you give me a discount, if I blow through all your real estate, even better. So don't hate the developers. This isn't, this isn't Walmart's fault. Don't hate the player, hate the game, but we need to understand the game. And incidentally, talk to your assessors. Their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. All right, I presented this at the assessor's conference and I said, how is this fair and how is this equitable? To their credit, they're like, it's not. I'm like, where did the standard come from? Did Moses deliver this to you? By the way, they, th they thought this was hilarious. Um, you know, they, they don't know where this came from. So this is gonna affect the market dynamics of how your community grows. It's gonna be uh, hiding in plain sight, showing you all this stuff. Um, so let me just jump ahead. I think we need to, consciously investigate our own policies and our own practices. Um, you know, I was blown away. I just read Chuck's, Chuck Marone's new book um, and it, it never really dawned on me until he explained this. This is how we look at it roads. This is actually a state DOT uh, diagram from Alaska. This middle zone here is the Strode zone. This is where you have this kind of the futon as Chuck calls it of transportation. It doesn't, it doesn't, a futon isn't comfortable to sleep in. It's not comfortable to sit in as a couch, but it serves both purposes. Notice the biases in this diagram. For one, everything is a happy medium somehow in the middle of the diagram. It's just all awesome the way that this works out. There's no, there's no an analytic talking about that if you drive all these cars out here for, for new mobility, it will cause congestion. And that happens, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. We see this when we add lanes in, in, in development. Why is the diagram describing that? And it's like, it's like doing this like perfect Zen moment in the center of this diagram. So that's a bias to put that in the diagram. That's not how it actually functions. This is also biased language at the bottom here, where mobility for who? How is there a lot lower mobility in the, in the lower one? I would say it's more mobility for the buses, for the pedestrians, for the bicycles in the low zone that in the, in, the, in, the, in the local zone than in the, than the arterials. So let's be honest, why is it just one form of transportation that gets raised to the top? And secondly, just look at the colors of this diagram. High local access is red, that's bad. These are the biases and values hiding in plain sight when we put our, our stuff out there. What does that say to the audience or someone like me when I'm reading the, 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 this chart? It's saying that we need, to, we need to either be at this top zone or in the middle zone. And so Chuck's flipping that on its head and saying, we need to think about the value effect from a financial standpoint of these road designs. So if you take it and do that, you see a totally different diagram. And the strodes are in the center of all of this. They basically, it, you know, they basically gut the value of your community. You have a lot of value at the, at the slow streets and you have a lot of value when you have a highway going out to the middle of nowhere. Where you have that interchange, there's a lot of value out there. But in these kind of middle spaces, it's actually highly destructive to a city. So let's, let's recap. When you have a street, it's going to cost you money. But if you can get buildings adjacent to that street that provide wealth, it will pay for that street. If you just have this kind of strode out there, it's going to be super expensive to do that. And you're not going to get a whole lot of value out of it. So we were doing this in, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, this is the Walmart. 
and, and you look at these, look at these streets. This is this, look at all this mobility you got here with super high value. And that stuff has been in the community all the way today. It's pulling $340 million an acre of value versus the Walmart at 500,000. Walmart's only the last 20 years. So that, that, that diet of that road is actually causing a very low, low wealth return in the community. Community after community, we see this. And you don't have to be these big downtown buildings. These are, these are buildings in Indianapolis in the first ring suburb. And you know they they strode it out this road and it basically made this building go vacant. But even at vacant at four million dollars an acre, it's better than the Walmart at five hundred thousand. And in on the strode through the middle of the city, you're getting this kind of species of building that's coming in that's feeding off it. So these things, these these new buildings here, these gas stations are pulling half a million. Yet just two blocks away is the Village Dog Dog Daycare pulling one million. So that, that archetype that you see along those adjacent infrastructures, when you blow them out so that the only cars want to use them, you're going to get a car architecture. So right here on this one street, you can see this is the Hardee's at 400000 of value, and you can see what they've neglected. This is across the street. This is part of the old community. It's, pulling, it's still pulling $2 million, which is way more than the, than the Hardee's. So when you look on the, let's take some Colorado examples. This is, this is Idaho Springs. You can see the downtown in here and the value that it produces with this big purple mountain. And this is their strode on the south side of, of Idaho Springs. Uh, this is Durango. You can see the downtown right here and the strode by, bypass that goes around downtown right there. If you look at you know, Windsor, Fort Collins, you can see the edges of the community versus the downtowns. And again, that street truck structure will create a genetic, a, gen, uh, um, a genetic material of urbanism or suburbanism based on the cross-section of that street. If you facilitate and drive mobility, you're not gonna get somebody walking against it. No one wants to build a two-story building there. And this is where our biases can shoot ourselves in the foot. And just to close, um, I, this has been going around. I, I tweeted about this, the, the Mukted, um, you know, what they, what they call highways and, and what they call streets. All right. So I'm an urban designer. I'm trained in understanding urban design. It is completely insulting to see a transportation profession look at a highway with this is its definition a general term for denoting public right of way or public way for purposes of vehicular travel, including the entire area of the right of way, right? That's the definition of a highway. So only for vehicles, no bicycles, no feet, no humans, only vehicles. Yet, when you look at the definition of streets, this is what they say. How is it that you can look at these two different transportation forms and just go, ah, oh, see highways. I'm, I'm supposed to take you seriously. And this is like, we, we look at how the world is built. And if these are your professionals that are out there tinkering with and playing with these road infrastructures, and this is the bias that they have about what they're supposed to do, what does that say to me as an urban designer when I'm trying to get buildings built or somebody that's trying to do a main streets program or somebody that's trying to be a planner and have a zoning code for some buildings? you're working against the economic consequences of your community. So just to close, I view this all as geo accounting, you know, it's just putting like your accountant, I'm just gonna put numbers on a map and show you what's going on. And you, like your accountant, you know, I honestly don't care, like your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat. I don't care what you do as a community. You should be conscious to the decisions that you're doing and understanding where you're leaking your money, where you're not connecting silos, where you have policies that are inadvertently draining your wealth. And just to close, I'll give you five steps to do this. And this is the way that we practice. You wanna diagnose everything in an apples to apples basis. You wanna put your professional biases on the curb and just th think about things apples to apples. That's why we recommend value per acre or anything per acre um, or per square foot. Um, you wanna understand how your standards affect impact. If I don't charge you for, for a, a lift station, I'm, I'm gonna have an impact on how that land is used. Um, you want to consider geo relevant, geospatial relevancy in your land use. Again, if that lift station is needed because you're building in a wetland, that's a conversation you need to understand. Um, and that should be discussed. 
we're big advocates for visualizing this stuff, put it into um, geospatial models or visual models so the community can see it and let people realize this is, these are all choices. So back to that Eugene example, it's like, are we choosing to not use uh, impervious for roads? Let people choose that. And then finally, you're never gonna get it perfect. Don't shoot for perfect, just shoot for iterating. You wanna try little things here and there, experiment, see how it works, feedback, and then iterate. So it's all incremental changes and put it on a map so people could see it and definitely read Chuck's books. His newest book is mind blowing, The Recovering, The Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. And thanks for letting me do your math. Thanks, Joe. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Um, we'll go into the Q&A here. And I know uh, um, Patrick and, um, and folks on our end will help uh, look at your questions, so type them into the chat. Um, and I can start off with kind of maybe one question just to get us going here. And if anybody wants to bounce off this, we can kind of think of this as a little bit of a think tank. We got 50 or so people on here. And I guess the advice I'd be looking for as a, as a staff member of the DOT, and I know you love DOTs, as do I. And you know, going back to kind of your the part in your presentation where you're talking about the the maintenance cliff we're heading towards the the fiscal cliff. And so, when I was at the City of Rifle, we did a lot of analysis of this, and and City Council kind of determined well we can't really keep sprawling anymore because we can't afford it because those the revenues from that land use pattern won't pay for that infrastructure. We've got to do more infill, and uh, they were our City Council was really thinking ahead on this and it's hard to do that in politics and it's hard for local governments it's hold hard for state the state dot's and we've certainly at cdot have such a huge maintenance backlog and one of the things i think i've seen is since i've been at cdot for six months is kind of this uh feeling around the state is we're looking at projects like there's transit projects and there's road projects and if you're putting more money towards transit you're taking away from roads and if I'm in a small town or rural area how am I CDOT's not going to be able to afford to maintain my road anymore because you're doing all this transit and what I've tried to kind of find a way to say and this is where I'm looking if you can give me some punchy one-liners or how to how to say this better is you know to me we put roads in one bucket and transit in another but roads should be split into capacity projects and maintenance projects. And the fact there's actually, those can work against each other. If we're doing capacity and then the land use around that capacity project is not providing the revenue to do maintenance, we're actually better off putting the money towards transit because that can help us have the money to have maintenance down the road. Um, and so, I think that's one of the things that is CDOT's doing its next 10 year planning process, which by the way, I would encourage everyone to participate in that. Look for your local TPR meetings that are upcoming over the, for the fall and winter. Um, but you know, I guess I'm looking for a way to kind of bring this kind of urban economic picture into the, the process as people are thinking about what kind of projects lead us to a truly sustainable system in the long run and any thoughts you have on that yeah i mean i'd, I'd start with well one is at a state level it's 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 going to be a little complicated but um you could still do it like in, when we did indianapolis uh they have enough roads to go from indianapolis to anchorage that's how much roads they currently have inside their community and we mm -hmm. put it on a map and showed it to them. Now I'd been there, we, we did their project was like three months long. And then I was in their community for a week and the whole time, I mean, the roads are horrendous. They're out of shape. They don't work well. Um, they're, they're beat up and they just don't have any money. They have enough money to, so if you can think in your mind, there's a map with roads going from Indianapolis to Anchorage, yet they only have enough money to get to Eau Claire, Wisconsin like the community got their brain around it. They drive on these roads all day long, but instead what they do is they express their frustration that like our government is, is, is failing because, you know, Nathan, you're, you, we're paying you too much. You're just like sitting on your butt, taking our money. Why don't you go, we should, we should liquidate Nathan and fill a pothole. Like that's how the citizens think about it. But if you show them the map and say, sorry, you know, you're, you've built this system and it's big. 
I think we need to be honest with citizens to get them to understand that the amount of asphalt that we have down right now is way too much. That was just one city. If you add up all of Colorado's street infrastructure, how many times could you go around the planet? And that would be mind blowing. And that would play over by Kansas as much as it would play over in Grand Junction, Colorado. It's like, look, it's, it's, it costs stuff for this. And I, and I think that's the thing is that, you know, when I'm not being, maybe I should say it a little bit more pointedly, I'm a visual communicator. Y'all just sat through about 200 slides in 45 minutes. People are visually oriented. You know, it's like people are visual learners. 65% of the audience is visual. So take the time to show a graphic to people. And even in Rifle, you know, if you put the map of the roads that Rifle owns, they, Rifle probably has enough roads to make it all the way to Utah. You know, and that that would freak people and rifle out. But instead, they're you know genuinely honest. They try to solve a problem. They add more infrastructure, and we're, we get in these habits without thinking of long term costs. Um, so that's that's where I'd start. Um, I think that sustainability is: can you actually sustain your existing roads? Let's start there. <laughs> it's like that's a, no no solar panel road or, or kind of whatever kind of voodoo technology we're trying to come up with is going to solve this problem. Uh, asphalt is a byproduct of oil production. When we've reached peak oil and we're in this downward slope, where are we going to be getting gasoline from? It's just not going to happen. We're not going to be getting asphalt uh, as well, the more we go to our electric technologies. So at, people aren't even talking about the fact that we're not going to, there's going to be wars for asphalt in the future with different states. It's not going to be pretty. Um, and that's the thing is like, I, it drives me nuts when people are more than happy to talk uh, talk about autonomous vehicles and solar farms and all this other stuff. Y'all are running out of water. You know, it's like that's probably a bigger thing to talk about. Um, but it's depressing. I see that there's a comment from uh, Karen uh, Hancock in the chat about a template. Um, this is recorded, so steal what we do. Um, just start in those processes. We always recommend a value per acre model. Uh, of your community is one of the first places to start. Start with where your money's coming from. Um, in the state of Colorado, you can at least get your retail taxes. Those retail tax models that I showed in this presentation are illegal in the state of North Carolina. So count your blessings. You can at least see that. Um, communicate with your citizens about the tax break that you get at a state level for residential versus commercial. That's one of the reasons why I put that in here is that that's a tax break. So if you're, if you're, if you're taxing residential properties uh, one fourth where you're taxing commercial properties, that's, that's a TIF, that's a tax break. Um, it's just because it's tax assessment policy, we don't consciously see that as a subsidy, but we need to, it's just all about being human with your citizens and empathizing with their position and trying to find a way to communicate with them. Um, Joe, there's, there's, a question. Joe, there's a question in the chat around traffic engineers and street operations professionals and you know, how do you get them to be champions for data-driven development? And what, what sort of examples of, of that sort of change have you seen? Um, to, and what, what sort of motivates that, that kind of different way of thinking about data-driven development? Well, I've, I mean, just, I'm optimistic. Um, you know, when I started practicing in urban design 30 years ago, God, I hate to say that, that's scary. Um, it was like, transportation engineering and transportation wasn't even part of the conversation. Um, it was, you know, urban designers and planners trying to figure out how to have a conversation with these people. And I think it was like, well, people like Walter Kulosh, who was a transportation engineer back in, in Florida, I think, and a handful of people started challenging. Uh, I think they basically focused on rewriting the ITE standards. Um, and so that, that really broke things open. And it was, Inside the big cities, you get sophisticated transportation engineers that actually understood city planning, but the majority of the world aren't these big cities. It's all these middle market cities, small places, state engineering offices. I mean, and it's not to say that these people are nefarious and they're evil. It's just that they've operated in a silo where they don't understand the effects outside their silo. So it's not really their fault. It's just their practice. And guilty as charged, when I worked in planning, you know, I was like, I would go totally nuts talking about zoning issues and form-based codes and all that stuff. And I would, I never talked to the finance officer. I never talked to the assessor. 
Um, so I think it's for everybody on this call, take a, take a moment to go try to figure out another part of your government. Go talk to the assessor, talk to the finance officer and let them know about city planning issues. The same is true to the engineering departments. Planners should talk more with them. And if you're an engineer on this call, do the same and learn more about city planning and what your effect could be. Um, you know, it's got to be frustrating as an engineer. They, they widen the road out outside of town to get to the next place. And then all the local land use decisions just start gobbling up that road and de decrease its mobility by putting more access onto it. They don't want that. So I don't think the Strode is a ha is happy medium for anybody. The Strode is just as frustrating from a transportation standpoint as it is from a, a value standpoint. And I was doing a project in Wyoming and um, it was kind of funny. I'm, I'm not making this up. It was like Casper, Wyoming. There was this good old boy that developed this whole section of town outside of town. And it was like, this guy was straight out of central casting. He was this big cowboy dude. He kept his arms on his belly like this and he, he had a gun and he had a big cowboy hat. And the planners wanted me to go talk to him about changing his ways of development. And I said, I went and talked to him. He's a nice guy but he wasn't evil. You know, he's basically taking advantage of the subsidies that were in place. So he's not stupid. So it's not really his fault for doing the wrong thing. We've set up the system that he could do that and get away with, and make money on it. So he thought he was actually doing the right thing because he was being rewarded. So I think that's the, those are the conversations we need to change um, as professionals. A little, little different one in the chat, which is about at the most recent um, Colorado Municipal League Conference, someone shared that because of online purchases, cities are increasingly seeing sales tax revenue coming from residential properties. You see this happening. What, what do you suggest in terms of, you know, how, how do you address that influence of in, around redevelopment options? Why should it matter? That if the, the, the sales tax is coming from residential you know, sort of from online. So the difference, you don't see oh. a difference in terms of where that revenue comes from. Albeit. No, because, because who was walking into that commercial building and making the purchase? That was a resident. So shocking news, humans buy things. So should it matter if they're buying that thing from a commercial property or if they're buying it from sitting in their house? What's the logical rational nexus between that production and the cost of the city? So you know, it's, and we tell people this all the time, when you look at retail numbers, it's all based on the citizens that are in your community. The only way to increase retail sales is either add people or grow their income. Humans spend a third of their money in retail transactions. So you set up your tax system to do that. You know, I, th I think, and I would argue that, that there needs to be a, a change in the way that we do our taxation. That's one of the reasons why we do those 3D models of the, of the cost and the revenue, we need to be starting to think about, and you go to Australia, you go to Canada, you go to some states, they actually charge more in fees than they charge in taxes because taxes are so arbitrary. Why should it matter what I, if I go and buy like a TV that all of a sudden I need to pay this for how the city operates? What's up with that? And, and so you in Colorado in particular has set up this tax system of tax avoidance at a, at a, at a residential level. So you're putting it on the back of purchasing. So what is what does a, a sales transaction have to do with the logical rational nexus of a city? You're just finding a way to look for money because you're under taxing at a property tax level. Um, but you're not alone in that. Daphne, who's on our on our stake, land use uh, stakeholder group, has got a question. Daphne, you just want to articulate that? It's in the chat as well, related to modifying tax structure for short-term rentals in particular. Daphne, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I was just interested, Joe, if you had any thoughts about this, something that uh, Colorado's legislature is, is uh, contemplating right now is modifying the tax structure of short-term rentals, which are, um, of course, um, taxed residentially right now at 7%. Um, proposals that are being considered right now would uh, potentially put those at the commercial rate. So I was just wondering how you think, you know, that would affect these economic models, um, economic analysis of sprawl in general, if um, those residential zones do begin bringing in um, commercial 
rate revenues and particularly for those communities that have you know a high concentration of these short term rentals. Daphne, I wish I had another 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> I got I've got email me at okay. joe at urban hyphen three dot com. Um, I've got a, an hour long presentation that we did at the Congress for New Urbanism earlier this year. In January, our state, our state requires a reassessment every four years. My city and my county both adopted reparations. I know they're not going to do anything with it. They're just like, want to feel good. Like, oh yeah, we, we, we're, we're open-minded liberal people, but it was just a bunch of all show and no go on the policy. So we decided to do an analysis on our assessment system to see whether or not it was racist and biased. And sure enough, we found out that it was. But one of the things that we found was that, now set aside what people talk about your state policy for a second. Let me ask you a question. Is, uh, is a hotel, is that an, an apartment building? Mm, no, no question. Okay, so when that house is being used for commercial purposes as a hotel, why do we call it a house? So you shouldn't have to pass a law saying that the house needs to be seen as commercial because it is used as Airbnb. The use of that property is a commercial use. Or if we're going to interpret commercial and residential, that because it's an architecture type of a house, it is therefore a house, then we should do the same thing for a hotel. That is an architectural type of a short-term rent, of a, of a, of a, of a single occupancy um, small footprint apartment building just happens to be an overnight apartment building, right? Mm -hmm. So that is just your assessors choosing not to apply the policy of commercial. And that's the standard of actually the assessment policy that if it's commercially used with income, then it is to be judged under commercial standards. That's their standards. Their, their international standards say to do that. So why your local, what your assessors are doing are playing at both sides of the coin. They're like, oh, it's not us. We need state policy. It's like, no, that actually is you. So pull your state law and look at it. And you'll see that it's, it says, it refers to the International Association of Assessing Officers Standards. And so why are they choosing to not follow those international standards? Mm -hmm. I would challenge that. I don't think you need laws to do that. You don't need to take that to the state legislature and say, oh, hey, we're a bunch of idiots. We don't understand what buildings and how they're used. Could you please give us new law so that we can see what these buildings look like? Yeah. Unfortunately, in the short-term rental conversation, it's a little bit more complicated because a lot of our local governments don't actually have access to data to know where the short-term rentals are. Can't, you can't open up VRBO or Airbnb and pull a map. You can't. There's a website called AirDNA that tracks them all. Yeah. No. So, yeah. I don't. I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole here, but I would love to maybe talk with you offline about the, okay. the shortcomings there. But I really appreciate your thoughts about it. Yeah. No. We, we have a we have a huge problem here in Asheville with that mm -hmm. because you know we're we're a day's drive from half the United States population. So when that house gets purchased, y'all would be stupid not to buy a house in my county and Airbnb it. We have ridiculous occupancy. We have like 90% occupancy in Airbnb. You can buy a house. Like I pulled a house that's on the side of a mountain up here. It's like an $800,000 house. It's renting for $1,000 a night. So even at 70% occupancy, that's pulling a quarter million dollars a year. So that would float a $3 million mortgage. $800,000 house, $3 million mortgage. It's a no brainer to buy one of those things and just cash flow it. So as a resident and as somebody that's got employees, all that housing stock's getting pulled out of the market and they have no place to live. Or they, you know, people competing, and I'm sure this happens in a lot of communities in Colorado, particularly in the front range, you're getting people buying in cash on the front steps of these houses and pricing people out. Regular people have to get a mortgage. They can't like compete on a staircase and just buy it from an owner. And so I think, I think that's a problem. Going, we're, we're all disrupted in the housing market and I would argue that, you know, it's, it's good that you're all are having the conversation, but um, send me an email and I'll send you that video. Um, there's a lot of things you can, you can do in your community with that. Thank you. And we have time for maybe one more question. And in the chat is about, is, is related to this municipality, municipality, excuse me, our counties with smaller amount of resources 
or fewer resources in terms of collecting, analyzing, and particularly communicating the types of information and data that you provided? Are there, are there sort of cost effective and shortcuts or less sophisticated ways that are able to communicate the same message for communities with fewer resources and, and staff? Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, I, I call it a pick and poke method. You don't need to have a GIS map. You could just grab some properties and just do things on an apples to apples basis. So, um, you know, Nathan was out in Rifle, which is not exactly like a, the, the metropolis. It's a tiny little town and they could at least have the conversation. And we did, a, a, this is before we did GIS, we did the pick and poke method where we just grabbed a bunch of houses, a bunch of buildings, did their value per acre so that people could at least start move the conversation forward. Um, in New Hampshire, uh, the state housing office hired us to just do the whole damn state. But you know, New Hampshire is like a really big county in uh, Colorado. But from a from a number of parcels standpoint, it's a whole lot more parcels than than your counties out there. So um, you know, the, the the software is sophisticated and powerful enough. We were able to blast out the whole entire state. But then what we did from a story standpoint, what they wanted was uh, like, a, like a cohort sample. So who's the mountain resort town type? Who's the coastal resort type? Who's the college town? Who's the old industrial place that's like dead as a door now? And so we pooled those communities. We did about 15 cities so they could learn from each other as a, as a peer sample, but also learn from other communities across the state. So we weren't showing them Vermont, let's say, we were showing them themselves. But that's what the state could do is, you know, do a simple um, blast out to the whole community so they could have it. We did a model in Salt Lake County for the, they have a strong mayor form of government there in uh, Mayor McAdams for the state of, of uh, Salt Lake or the county of Salt Lake asked us to do an entire public asset valuation of all publicly held assets. So think of it this way, if a city has a parking lot that they're wasting or actually the city of Salt Lake had this uh, four acre, or sorry, eight acre um, garbage truck site that was a thousand feet away from a train station. Unbelievably bad waste of real estate. So we went ahead and modeled all of the cities in Salt Lake County for public assets to see how you could harvest new wealth. You didn't have to sell the land. You could just rent it out to a developer and get taxable basis on something that's currently non-taxable. So think of the, the highway thing that we did earlier. We did that for the entire county and the whole county is worth $131 billion. The new wealth that they build on that is 45 billion, which is a big jump on 131. And that's what that's able to do is local communities could stimulate their own income inside their community. But you know the county was gonna see a benefit from that because it's all one big county. So that's, that's I thought that was a good model of um, sort of benevolent um, leader in, in the county to help all of these towns get on the same page. I have one more, one more, Joe, or are you? Sure, yeah, you got yeah. me. Felix <laughs> Landry from Grand Junction, are you, if you're on there, you, you have a question in the chat, which I'll just read it, which is that he worked for a wealthy suburban enclave, had a large concentration of very high dollar sprawl, allowing them to cash flow their infrastructure every year. He showed them their data, they shrugged and said they just raised their taxes to keep the suburban form they'd like. Um, what's, your, what's your sense of argument? Is it a environmental, or ethical kind of, what's that conversation look like if you were to have that conversation, uh, Joe? I mean, if they're choosing to do that, that's fair. Um, you know, they're paying their way. If, if there's, external impacts where people have to drive into their community because they've pushed everybody else out, you know, that's an externalized cost on that resident. So I'd, I'd have to see how that's being captured. I think Aspen's a great example of this where, um, you know, they, 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 people have to come to work in Aspen, you can't price them out. Um, so Aspen has had to have the maturity to try to take on to an affordable housing. It's still not easy. Um, you know, most, most of the Aspen workers are shuttled in through buses and mass transit. That's an additional expense that the region picks on, uh, picks up because of what's going on internally in Aspen. But I think, I think y'all have a lot of these examples. Um, Aspen's like the no-brainer example, but there's a lot of ski communities 
that that have these externalized effects. Um, and again, it's I, I I just start with be transparent, put it out there so people can see it, make sure they're aware of the long term consequences and costs. Um, what's the carbon effect of shuttling all of these people in every day, um, and how's that going to work out when you run out of snow? It might turn into a mountain biking community. I don't know. I'm, I'm a mountain biker. I'm okay with that. But it's just, you know, it's just, these are things that it, it's, we're humans. We're going to be making weird choices. There's actually a couple of books I want to recommend in addition to Chuck's. One is called Predictably Irrational by Daniel Airely. Um, and the other one is called Misbehaving by um, Richard Thaler. Richard Thaler won a Nobel Prize in economics with it. But there's there's behavioral science on how we choose the wrong thing over and over again. So most of the people on this on this webinar here, um, we're rational actors. We're like you know we're 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 the quantified people. We're the, like, the planners and the engineers. We're quants. Um, we're not normal, and you all know this when you talk to your friends at a cocktail party or something like that. We're different. We're nerds. The majority of the world, the majority of humans, aren't quantitative thinkers the way that we are. So don't expect rational thinking. But those two books help you understand why we predictably choose the wrong things. There's actually a human flaw called delayed discounting that's kind of part of our DNA and how our brains operate. Humans will psychologically discount future costs and delay it into the future. This is why we have an impossible time with climate change. I'm not confident that we're not gonna get, we're gonna get to it. We're gonna, we're gonna end up having some traumatic experiences before we change. And, and for people that know family members, my, my dad had a seven bypass heart surgery. Every Minicozy man in my family has had heart issues. It wasn't a surprise when my dad had his heart surgery, but he did nothing to change his diet or exercise. So surprise, when he got his heart surgery, then he changed his behavior. So humans are weird. We're the, it's like we just, we don't deal with costs until we're hit by them. One of the reasons why we do that red black model is to bring the future to the present so that you can see the heart attack happening. It's very deliberate in the graphics. That's why it looks like it's bleeding is because it is. So show it to them, show people the heart attack. Then they'll be more apt to make a change. Well, on, on that note, um, in terms of showing, showing them the heart attack, that's an interesting way to end. Thank you, Joe, so much for your time, for your efforts, and particularly um, wanted to make sure we shout out to CDPHE and Kate Townley for helping to um, support this um, presentation. I'll turn it back over to you, um, Nathan, to give us a closing, but, but again, thank, thanks again, Joe. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Jonathan, thanks, Joe. I think the uh, only thing I wanna say in closing is that November 15th registration for that session is in the chat. That's gonna be a very interactive session. Dola's gonna lead it as far as their uh, future grant criteria for, for a grant program that will help incentivize land use best practice. So we really need uh, the folks on this call to join us and really help us think through how do we define best practices of land use and how would you put that into grant criteria? Because that's a tricky thing to do as we've been lolling over our heads. So we really need uh, folks from all kinds of different cities and towns and counties and areas to help us do that. So thanks so much and uh, we'll see you next time.